Hi, this is Justin Coletti. You may know me from Sonic Scoop, but today I am on the Plugin Alliance channel and we're gonna be doing a walkthrough and a demonstration of the latest EQ from Plugin Alliance. This is the Amec EQ250, and it is a faithful digital recreation of an EQ from one of my favorite EQ brands in history. This Amec EQ250 is modeled after the EQs from Sontem, notably their MEP250EX. This one is actually an emulation of a Sontech that is personally owned by Plugin Alliance founder Dirk Ulrich. And the originals were mastering grade equalizers that were also favorites of a lot of mix engineers on applications like Mixbus and individual instrument subgroups. Really awesome stereo EQ and the second EQ a little bit like it in the Amec line. And I'll give you a little bit of the history of these original units, how exactly this one works, how this fits into the Plugin Lines family of EQs, and we'll get to listen to it together and compare it to its close cousin, the EQ200 from Amec as well. First, we'll hear them in bypass, then we'll hear the EQ250, then the EQ200. Let's go. First, a quick little bit of history to help give you an idea of just how important and monumental this EQ was in the history of audio technology and why people still covet these things today and pay top dollar for them to have the real analog units inside their studios. You may have heard of two guys who were instrumental in the development of the parametric EQ. You could even say they invented the parametric EQ. They were George Massenberg and Burgess McNeil. And these two worked together in the mid to late 1960s developing really what we know as the very first commercially available parametric equalizers. And they debuted their creation in 1971. And it was the first time the audio world had really seen something like this, something we take for granted today, the fully parametric equalizer. The flexibility of these EQs, the transparency of these EQs, this idea of being able to adjust the bandwidth of your EQ bands was really kind of new and novel and a major breakthrough. But what's really interesting is that these very first EQ designs from the early to mid 1970s are still considered among the best parametric equalizers ever made. Well, those two people who helped invent these first parametric EQs, George Massenberg, Burgess McNeil, eventually they went their own separate ways. And George Massenberg founded his company, GML, George Massenberg Labs, and Burgess McNeil founded his company, Sontech. And both of these companies made really similar parametric EQs, but each of them developed their own fans. Previously, Plugin Alliance introduced the Amec EQ200, which was modeled after Massenberg's GML 8200 EQs, super important EQ in the world of mastering and mixing for many decades, and again, still sought after today. But now this EQ250 recreates the other side of that coin, the Sontech MEP250 EQs. And although these two EQs are so similar in design, they have slightly different sound characters, even with the same exact settings. Here, I'll bring up the plugin version of both of these here on screen so we can see them back to back. Right now, I've got the Amec EQ250 up here. And if I go over and bring up the Amec EQ200, you'll see that the controls and design are really similar between the two of them. Both of them have five bands of parametric EQ with fully variable gain, boosts, and cuts. Both of them have these fully variable bandwidth controls with the ability to switch into a shelf on the low frequency and high frequency controls. And both of them have really similar frequency range options for each of the bands. There are some subtle differences there. For instance, the low band on the EQ250 goes from 15 hertz up to 620, whereas on the EQ200, it goes from 15 hertz to 780 hertz. But there's a lot of similarities in layout there. 
When it comes to control, one of the things that differentiates these two EQs is that you have a bit of a narrower range for boost and cut on the new EQ250. It is a boost and cut of up to 12 dB with this button up, and if you push this button down, it's a boost and cut of up to 6 dB. Compare that to the up to 15 dB boost and cut on the EQ200. Both of them also have this extra unit from Brainworks down here at the bottom where we get to control input gain and output gain. We have access to our TMT section that is going to help emulate these subtle differences in channel-to-channel -channel tolerances on real analog gear. We've got the mono maker and the stereo with control, a must-have especially for mastering and mix bus applications. The ability to increase or decrease the total harmonic distortion on the unit and an output gain control. Also, unlike the originals, you can put these into a mid-side mode, and here you can decide whether or not the two channels are linked together in stereo. So, a couple more really cool digital functions. We have this gain scale control here. If I were to just dial in some quick settings, if we turn the gain scale up or down, it increases or decreases the magnitude of our EQ changes across the board, allowing us to dial in some fairly extreme EQ settings that sound really good and then just goose them back a little bit or goose them up a little bit further. But you might ask yourself, because these two EQs seem to have such similar looking controls, why bother to have the both of them? Each one has their own distinctive character. When we put these two EQs in the exact same settings, they're gonna sound subtly different from one another. And we'll get to hear that back to back right now together. I've got a track pulled up here. I've just got an instrumental version of a hip hop track from a mastering client of mine named Petar. He makes music under the name Prince of Bosnia, and we've got just a cool hip hop groove here. This is the totally unmastered version of the track, and I'm going to apply some totally unnecessary EQ boost to this. I'm just going to do the most stereotypical thing that people might do on the mix bus with these EQs, which is to do a little bit of an EQ boost somewhere in the bottom, say 80 hertz, and to do a little bit of an EQ boost up on the top, say somewhere around 10K. And for right now, I'll put them just as bell filters, and then we'll hear them again as shelving filters. And I'm going to exaggerate these boosts for you. Let's do a 6 dB boost in both the lows and the highs. Again, not something that this track needs, but I think it'll give you a sense for how the overall tone of these two EQs differs when pushed into some fairly significant settings. Here's our EQ250. I'll put this one up top. And whenever I'm soloing this green track here, we'll be hearing it through the EQ250, first in bypass. And whenever I solo this blue track down here, we'll be hearing the EQ200 with the same settings. You can see I've got dialed in here our 6 dB boost in the lows and in the highs at about 80 hertz and about 10K on both of them. Let's hear this track first in bypass, then with the EQ250, then with the EQ200. Here we go. So, although we're doing really similar things here, I hear slight differences in both the low end and the high end. To me, there is maybe something a little faster and tighter about the sound of the EQ200, although it does have some really nice deep extension in the low end here, making it feel maybe a little bit more hyped up with this EQ200, where I'm just getting a touch more kind of earthy smoothness maybe out of this EQ250. Now, your perception of what each of these EQ sounds like relative to one another may be different depending on the exact material and genre you're hearing it on, depending on the exact area of the frequency spectrum that you're boosting or cutting. So it's really hard to make blanket statements about how or in which ways these two EQs sound a little bit different. But generally speaking, people often think about something like the EQ200 as being a little bit more precise, while they think of something like the EQ250 as maybe being a little bit more forgiving. 
Let's hear the same kind of thing again, this time with just slightly different settings. We'll still keep the big 6 dB boost in both the lows and the highs, but this time I will switch things around and I'll make that low frequency boost happen closer to 130 hertz and our high frequency boost happen more like 6K. And now instead of bell filters, I have them moved here into shelving filter mode. I'll go ahead and bring up the exact same settings on the EQ200. And let's hear those back to back. All right, well, the differences are subtle, but they are there. And just some of these slight differences in layout as well, the 12 dB boost and cut versus the 15 dB boost and cut can kind of lead you in slightly different directions just by using the interface. But pick your favorite. It might vary from track to track, or you might come up with a permanent favorite of your own. But the best way to come up with your favorite is Again, try them out for yourself. Go over to plugin-alliance.com where you can try out these or anything else they make for free for two weeks. Or this new EQ250 is now just another part of your mega subscription, no additional charge right alongside the EQ200. Hope you get to trying them out. And when you do, let me know in the comments down below, which one is your favorite? Do you have a different favorite for different applications? And what are some of your favorite things to do with this style of EQ? We want to hear from you about all that. Thanks for hanging out with me for this quick walkthrough and demonstration. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop, this time on the Plugin Alliance channel. See you next time. <laughs>